I'd like to call to order tonight's special meeting of the Board of Finance, and I would ask folks to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, thank you for that. I guess the first item on the agenda, public input. I see that we do have some members of the public with us tonight. Would anyone like to speak? Uh, if you would either take yourself off mute or use <coughs> the hand function. The question. I don't see anybody. Nobody's raising their hands or unmuting. Okay. Um, and it looks like we have only one page, right? So we can see everybody, yeah. Okay, um, correspondence, Dion? No. Okay, next topic would be the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting from July 14th, 2020. As these were distributed earlier, I'd ask uh, to entertain a motion to accept them as submitted. I'd make a motion to accept them as written. Second. Okay, any discussion? Not hearing any, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, unanimous. Um, uh, Dion, I've just got a text message that D cannot get in. Can Do you have her email address? Can you text her the link? Um, well, it's the link that's on the agenda. Here, if you don't, I'm going to mute myself and. Are you going to take care of business there? Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on then to the next item on the agenda, and that is the consideration of the section 10 9 salaries, in particular the town clerk. Sorry about that. I'm going to mute myself. I hope that was just a passing by. That wasn't for me. <laughs> I do the board members feel as if we need to rehash the background on this matter? No. Okay, then what I'll do is I'll entertain a motion uh, for discussion purposes. Okay, and the motion is beginning retroactive to July 1st, 2020, the town clerk be paid in a, an annual stipend in the sum of $5,000 payable pro rata over the town of Bethel's regular pay periods, provided that the town clerk continues to prefer, perform the service and that there are sufficient funds in the train station parking account at the time of the current pay period. Is there a second of that? A second. Okay, discussion. Um, Bob, it's Nick. I would support this motion. I'm not sure I would go the whole 5,000. I, I, I would be more comfortable 2,500 this year, 2,500 next year. Um, but again, I do like to reward, um, you know, extra people do, I'm sorry, hard work. So I would vote yes for it, but you're giving it to her all now. So I, I wouldn't support anything next year. So that just saying, I, I, we're giving it to her all right now. So uh, Nick, Nick, uh, I'm going to defer to Brad. I had a discussion with him uh, at an earlier date to find out what is the status of the um, of the account, how much is in that account, and what is the annual um, uh, funding of that account. So Brad, if, if you could just give us an update on that and maybe um, that would make Nick more comfortable with the amount of $5,000. Uh, so there's over $250,000 in that account, and in the 2020 year, it's unaudited, but the account grew by $30,000. Um, so as long as, you know, we're not paying it for the next 100 years, we probably should be okay. We might even be okay doing the next 100 years if it keeps growing at that rate. Um, and Nick, if I can just add, I mean, she's been doing this service for the last couple of years. 
So I understand you're concerned about maybe picking it up 50% now and 50% next year, but she's been doing the services for the last few years. So I, I think she's entitled to the full 5,000 at this point. Okay. And again, I'm not speaking against it. No, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. care if there was a million dollars in that account. It's just when you give somebody something, you can't give it next year. And again, if she's doing it in her regular hours and not creating overtime, I get it also. But again, I'm not against it. I, I like rewarding good behavior. So I'm going to vote for it. Okay. Um, may I? May I? Yep. Cynthia? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I don't look at this as a, a reward, really. It, it would be you're trying to compensate her for extra duties. And I get that. And I believe when this was first proposed, it was before, you know, uh, the world went to hell in a handbasket. And I just think that right now, I, I wouldn't support 5,000 right now. In fact, I'm thinking, I would think more of like at 1,000 and just see, because um, it just seems very, in the climate that we're in, it just, you know, she may be entitled to it. I mean, I'm entitled to, to a job, you know? I, she has a job. It's great. I think she's great, but I just couldn't support five grand. Just can't. Yeah. So Cynthia, if I can just. Um, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Let me say. Let me say one more thing. Sure. I don't care how much money's in the account. That doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? It's like I got. If I got thirty dollars, that doesn't mean I have to spend it. So I'm just saying. Okay. That's it. So go ahead. Fair enough. No, that's that's. If, if you've stated yeah. your position and it's intractable, so no yeah. use, no use. To well, no. I mean, if you want to make a plea, I'm just saying that that the the argument about having the money in the account doesn't sway me. Okay. This this is not a pay raise. This is a stipend. I and know. Not not being paid out of um, Bethel uh, salary. This is being paid out of a unused funds at parking authority account, and so. Uh, and it, it's a reward for uh, exceptional amount of additional work that she has undertaken. And so I fully support the uh, $5,000. I'm just, I'm concerned about the word reward because we don't, I, I didn't think that that was necessarily a thing, like a, meritoc a meritocracy. I didn't think there was any sort of, I mean, I'm just confused about the word reward. So somebody explain it to me. If, if I can jump in here, Bob. It's, we're just using the word reward, but we're just, we're compensating her for her time that she's putting in. So it, it's a good thing. It's, we're not giving her a trophy. We're, re, we're, right. we're giving her, she's taken on extra duties. And I think as a group, we support that, that she's doing extra stuff in her job title. So that's why we're entertaining this mm -hmm. um, reward, if you want to call it. I, don't want to call I, it a reward. I totally get it. We cannot call it a reward because it's like, okay, I've taken on more work. It's compensation for work I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing a great job all across the board. Now, what were the options? I mean, she could, I mean, what were the options? Hire part-time help to do it? No, it fell right, it fell into her province. So I guess what I'm saying think, is, um, what, go ahead. Um, are you finished? Yeah, I'm finished. I think that the word stipend doesn't imply a reward. It's, it's paid for duties. The word for, reward, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but the word reward was used five times. The word stipend was used once, so. I think what's important is in the motion. The motion refers to it as a stipend. Stipend, right. Okay, very good. Right, Nick that's mentioned fine. rewarding, um, you know, extra work and, and initiative and so on, and you know, that's fine. But really it is a stipend for duties performed. And she laid out the hours that she spent on it. She had a very good um, justification for the amount, for the $5,000 that she was asking for. That's really the amount of time that she has spent um, valued at whatever per hour for doing these duties. So if you, like you said, Cynthia, if we had to hire somebody to do it part-time, it would have cost us $5,000 for those hours. Well, here's the thing, Karen, if I may, that um, it's just that things, it, it, we can't be inflexible in this current climate. Everything is up in the air. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve it, Lisa knows how I feel about her. I support Lisa all the, you know, across the board and I always have. I'm just saying that right this second, maybe not, you know, all 5,000, that's all. Well, is there something else we need that money for that would be more important? 
I mean, it's just that's a good. That's a good question because you know we probably have money. If there's extra money, one would think that it would go into the general fund. I guess I don't know where it would go. But, but the special, but isn't that a special fund? It can only be spent on training. It's stations. general fund. Bob King. Okay, so you're saying that there won't be any other thing that that would be spent on. Maintenance of the property. That's all. How much? How much money's in the account? It's it's in excess of two fifty, close to three hundred thousand. Okay, and when does uh, how is that the revenue from the kiosk and the parking and all that? Correct. Okay, all right. Well, that, I'm relaxing a little bit. I'll go up to two thousand, uh, Alex. <laughs> you want to make a motion, uh, Cynthia? Stipends for two thousand, Alex. Yeah, no, I I, I will make a motion. Um, I would like to uh, fund Lisa's stipend at two thousand dollars. And I know this will fail, but you know, I've got to give it a shot. Is yeah, that's my motion. Okay, then. Okay, back, the back. silence is deafening. Back to the original motion. Any more discussion? It, am I on the meeting yet? Hi, Brian. <laughs> am I here now? <laughs> <laughs> we hear anybody hear me or no? I'm yes, having like we a hear you, time. Brian. Oh, hi, guys. I missed. Hi your whole discussion. So I'll, I'll just remain silent and kind of get caught up here. We're just talking about uh, Lisa's uh, stipend. Um, you know, there's a debate between 2000 and 5000. Um, that's what we're talking about, Brian. That's all about the extra duty she's picked up for the train station. Um, Brian, I just made a motion because it was put at 5000. I just tried to amend the emotion, the, the, the motion. 2000 and there was no second. So I'd like to move the previous question. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, we need a second of the movement, I believe, don't we? Yes. No second. Okay, so uh, now we vote on moving the question. All those right. in favor, please signify. <laughs> Aye. 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 All right. Nay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. So the nays were well, do we for have Cynthia that? and who? I'll, I'll vote no if there's some other discussion. I'll vote Brian, no anyway. Brian, did you, wanna, Brian, did you want to? Missed, I, missed, I missed the whole discussion, so I, I apologize. I texted Nick. I've been trying to log on here, so I kind of missed your guys' whole discussion, and, and I, I truly apologize for that. So, okay. and, and Brian, we, we really just jumped right into the substantive question. Nobody felt like they needed a recap of where we were on the town clerk's uh, stipend for this work. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've talked about this the last few years, and I think Nick raised the right question. Is it all at once? And I think Robert answer well it really isn't this is something we contemplated some time ago and we just didn't act on it and this is the first time the recommendation by um, the town clerk reviewed by bob k uh with some input from brad was five thousand was reasonable so we had the motion at five thousand for the stipend that, that stipend is uh, again subject to the service still be always being performed by the town clerk and there being enough money in the account. So just again, I, I kind of caught the tail end. So this money will not come from any of the lines on our side that we have control over. This is a separate account that right. has doesn't get funded by us. It, it's totally self-funded by the, uh, That's right. the, the railroad. The, the, the parking authority. The parking authority. So okay. this, this this amount of five thousand will not in any way hit the Bethel financials. This will all just come out of that special fund. May I say and, something? I I I think I'm I think I'm okay now with that. Having thought about it, I think I can support that. But I will have to be prepared to answer the questions on Facebook when they ask why we okay. added five thousand. So. I, I'm, I'm amenable to 5,000. Sure. Bob, can I just ask one more question just so I know? And again, I apologize for being late to the party here. No um, what did we figure it was like 
hourly a week in terms of like how many hours it adds to her duties, did we say? Bob K, do you remember what the what that write up was? Um, let me quickly look through this. I don't know if she put in an, an amount. She fund uh, she works on it every day for the most part. Um, I don't see anything that's popping out, but I can I, I thought she said something along the lines of 10, 15 percent of her time is spent on the train station because of uh, all the managing duties she has to do, uh, the calls she gets from the um, uh, customers, the problems she has with the kiosk, kiosk she's seen on the second page, paper jams, card jams. She has to go down there uh, to fix those things, ordering supplies, refunding of uh, overcharges. I mean, there's a whole right. Items, Did, is she here? Is she in the meeting? I can't no, see anything. Not. No, she's oh. not in the meeting. Oh, okay, thanks. So, Bob, if it's if she's fit putting in at like fifteen percent, I'm just trying to just quickly do the math here. I'm going to tell you what I remember her saying, and I so, I think this is oh. correct. I think she said that it varies from day to day. That sometimes it could be an hour a day, and sometimes there could be an onslaught of Things. So it was very difficult for her to pin down the number of hours, but she said something happens generally every day. So, Bob, if we just like took 15%, right, and correct me again if I'm wrong here, we're talking about 15 times, oh, I'm sorry, six times just figure 50 weeks, that's 300. So 300 into 5,000. That's like we're paying 16 bucks an hour to compensate, correct? Is my math correct, Bob? I, I didn't check it out, but you know, I assume that's right. Um, yeah. Hey, Brad, how much do we pay uh, the fellow that uh, collects the coins? You know, at the kiosk, not the kiosk, but the meters. He's around $15 an hour, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, his is little, he gets like a weekly stipend of $70 plus an hourly, but it works out to be about $5,000 a year that we pay him. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, if it's not costing the taxpayers any money, and I mean, it sounds like it comes out to like 16 bucks an hour if it's 15% yeah. of the day. I mean, that doesn't seem unreasonable. Because what would it cost if we had to hire someone to do it? Well, that's the point. The other, At least that, if not more. You know? Yeah. Well, the other data point is the coin collector, which is about five grand. And again, look, we, we, we have the right to review this each year, and that's why yeah. it was really structured as a stipend. Right? It's, it's, and, and can I just confirm something? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I can't, you know, see you um, when I'm driving, which is a good thing. So I just want to confirm that money, there's 250 in it, 250 grand, right? And it yeah. only is used to maintain the... the property. Okay. I got it. Hi. Cleaning, cleaning uh, all yeah. right associated with the train station. But is there a separate line for paving in that or do they just try and keep enough if they have to pave the parking lot, they try and keep the amount up there? What's in the account um, can used at any time um, to maintain the property. So there's no line items, you know, budgeted line items for the property at all. But that would include that, that they try and keep enough to pave it every, whatever, 15 years, 10 years. Like that's not, that doesn't come from the town paving, it comes from theirs. That's right. Uh, if okay. I may jump in on that, Brian, uh, the, sure. the lot was paved not last summer, but the summer before DOT did that when they, because they expanded oh. the lot, they added, I think 150 new spaces. So okay. Didn't, we, we didn't have to pay for that out of the enterprise fund, DOT did. Oh, all right. As long as it's not, I mean, I mean, it's coming from that account and she's handling it, she's saving us money. It, I kind of agree with Nick that it makes sense. Good, because look, nothing's changed over the last couple of years, right? So all the facts are the same. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passed is unanimous. Uh, Bob so and... We got a little off track with that. I'm just not going to even record the call to move the motion because that actually did pass, but then we went back and we went into discussion. So we're just 
going to just move past that in the minutes, okay? That's fine. Yeah. We will be practicing. I won't know. All right. Um, moving on to the next agenda item, update on the fire apparatus uh, commission map. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, we got an echo there. Somebody's got a... Somebody might have to mute if you've got your phone going. Can you... Um, Dion, can you mute folks? Yep. Hello? Okay, I'm not hearing the echo. I think that's better. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you a verbal report tonight, and I'm also going to uh, share my screen with a report that the Board of Selectmen just got uh, at their meeting about a half an hour, about an hour ago. Uh, this is a final report uh, from the Sutphin Corporation uh, on the condition of Tower One, which is uh, in operation today uh, at Bethel Fire Department on South Street. So let me give you the, a, a very brief recap of this. Um, Sutphen, spelled S-U-T-P-H-E-N, is a major company that, that manufactures fire apparatus. Um, they have supplied many different fire trucks to the town of Bethel over the, for a number of decades. Bethel had a Sutphen tower truck that uh, had been purchased in 1977. In general terms, these trucks last about 20 years, uh, some usually a little bit longer than that because uh, we don't get the kind of pounding and daily use that you might get in a big city like New York or Chicago. Um, but the, uh, the 1977 apparatus was eventually retired in 2006. And rather than buy a completely new truck, um, the town of Bethel at that time in 2006 bought a new uh, ca uh, chassis, cab, and drivetrain and they took the ladder assembly off of the old Sutton Tower and had it uh, retrofitted onto the 2006 truck. So that is the truck that is in use today. Uh, at the time that this, ret uh, a retrofit of that type is not unusual, um, but it's usually only done where uh, the machines get relatively minor use and they're not, they're not going out and, and getting a lot of heavy duty use on a daily basis. At that time, the feeling was that the truck would be good for another, with, with the used ladder, with the, with the retrofitted ladder and tower assembly, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a very well-built uh, comprehensive machine, by the way. Uh, it has, uh, you know, an automatic, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose the terminology, but it, you, you can, it's got a water cannon that's fitted to the bucket. It can be uh, controlled from up there. It's, it's not just a simple ladder. It is a very, very well-structured piece of machinery. So the feeling was in 2006 when that was purchased, um, it takes about uh, eight months or so to retrofit. So the truck entered, per, entered service in 2007. And the, uh, the guarantee or the, the, you know, the, the strong indication at that time is that the, the town would get at least 15 years worth of use out of it before uh, we should be in a position to consider replacing the truck. So we, we are at this point coming up on year 13 with this truck. In, the, in recent years, going back about two years ago, Bethel Fire began raising um, the point that the truck was aging. Um, it was in the shop a little bit more often that they want than they would like, which is not unusual for, a, for a, an apparatus of that age. And they started talking about the possibility or the, the probability that within a few years, we would have to replace that truck. Uh, now, apparatus of, of this nature, all, all fire apparatus, apparatus must be inspected. Uh, this is a federal rule, federal law. They're inspected annually by a, by a, a, a non-interested third party. Um, we went back through the inspection records on this truck. It was inspected in July of 2018. It was found to have some defects. They were noted on the report. Uh, the truck was put in for repair. Every, all repairs were made satisfactorily. The July 2019 report, so just about uh, at the end of July, one year ago, uh, the truck was inspected again. That report had a clean bill of health. There was not a single um, notation in there of any uh, defect or you know, any urgent repair required. There was one, ver one notation on this that said, um, in this, this report, it said the truck has a, the hydraulics that operate the turntable with the tower. 
So the hydraulic system that makes the tower go up and down and turn sideways uh, to, to rotate on the bed of the truck had a chatter in it. And now the third party inspector is not a mechanic. They just simply look for these things. And so they, they don't do any repairs. They, there was a notation in this report, which again, I, I stress was, was a clean report. And it said, this should be checked out. So uh, from July, from the end of July, 2019 into the fall season, um, the uh, fire department did raise that uh, concern said, well, we, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a chatter in this thing that, that we have to check out. However, um, in about October, 2019, the truck was pulled completely out of service uh, by the chief engineer of Bethel fire department. And uh, this was without another inspection. This was without, uh, without recommendation by any mechanic or other expert, any engineer uh, with the company or with a third party test. Uh, the, the chief engineer from Bethel Fire simply decided that the, he thought the machine was dangerous because of this chatter um, vibration in the, in the ladder. So he pulled it out completely out of service. And for the most part at that point insisted that the Board of Selectmen immediately move to um, schedule a referendum to replace this truck. Um, there were numerous meetings with the Board of Selectmen. The words that were used was that this truck is, quote, beyond repair. Um, it's dangerous. It cannot be used. Um, they did keep it in service, but only so that the, equip the other equipment on it could be used, like the, the portable ladders and some of the other equipment that's on it, but the tower itself was unusable. So we, from, from uh, October 6th through there about 2019, the town of Bethel had to rely on mutual aid from nearby towns whenever a tower apparatus was, was, uh, was necessary. Um, the price given for uh, replacing this machine um, was 1.7 million. Uh, the machine that they wanted to um, to replace it with was a state-of-the-art C-grade machine. Uh, and, th and the previous summer, Bethel Fire had taken delivery of a C-grade uh, pumper, uh, pumper and tanker. And uh, they are beautiful machines. Um, the, the problems that the, the Board of Selectmen had was that, uh, that primarily we, we never really got a very clear answer as to why 1.7 million was needed to replace this truck. Um, tower trucks are expensive, there's no doubt about that. They generally run more than a million, although you can find them uh, for under a million if you are willing to wait for an opportunity. Uh, there are times when demo trucks become available. Um, even if a demo truck doesn't have all the equipment on it that you might need, you, they can be retrofitted. Sometimes other cities will order trucks and then for whatever reason not be able to take delivery. Um, these uh, options, sometimes you can even buy a gently used truck for far less than a million. But even with a new truck, the, the general price is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 million, not 1.7. We really never, never were given a very good reason that, uh, at least that I understood why the, the machine that we needed was, was that much more expensive. Um, unfortunately, there was some po significant political pressure put on the Board of Selectmen at that time leading up, and it, I, I think, in, in my opinion, I'm, I'm stating my opinion on this, I, this is not a fact, but in my opinion, um, it's no accident, it's no coincidence that um, when um, publications were issued that questioned the Board of Selectmen with the headline, um, are the Selectmen putting public lives in danger by not replacing this machine? It was just a few weeks before the municipal election in the fall of 2019. Uh, I, I think that those things were part and parcel. Um, the Board of Selectmen, um, still not having any real good uh, data to work with, elected to form a committee, uh, which we, we formed in December of 2019. We established the committee and, and commissioned it in January of 2020. The, the commission uh, comprised five uh, experts, in, in my opinion, there were four former fire, well, three former fire chiefs from Bethel, from the two different departments, from both uh, Bethel Fire and Stony Hill, one uh, fire apparatus chief mechanic, and then the chair of the commission was Mr. Richard Thode, who is chief of the Bridgeport Fire System for the entire city. 
so we felt we had a very highly qualified group uh, of uh, individuals to examine this truck and find out uh, if it could be uh, refurbished or it could be used. We even at one point uh, suggested the committee to the committee that we buy a used truck in the amount of six hundred thousand, and that was one of their first uh, one of their first charges was to look at that and decide if that was a good buy or a, a bad buy. Um, the committee. Um, quickly de determined that buying a used truck was not in the best interest of the town. So they set about to examine the uh, tower and uh, appraise its condition. And by the way, uh, not only were we told that the machine was not, uh, was unsafe to use in the fall of 2019, but we were also told that it would cost so many hundreds of thousands of dollars to refurbish it, that it wasn't worth doing, that we should immediately go to a referendum and replace the machine. Uh, the committee met, began meeting in January of 2020. Um, their, their first order of business was they contacted the Sutphin company. They asked for a, an expert technician, an engineer, to come out to inspect the truck and give it a thorough um, going over. Um, the COVID crisis hit before that happened, so it was delayed by several months. But in, the, in May of 2020, that individual did come out and spent about 10 hours uh, examining the truck and every and operating every system within the truck. Following that, they drove the truck to uh, a company called Shipman's in New London, Connecticut, which is um, Sutton Corporation's new authorized service center. Um, and Sutton engineers were on duty at that location because this is uh, this is a this is a new service center for Sutton, so they were overseeing the folks at this uh, independent repair center, which is now their authorized center for Sutton Corporation. So the bottom line was uh, the machine was not unsafe. The machine, um, it did have a chatter. I will quote to you what the engineer said uh, upon examining the machine uh, when it was pointed out that there was a chatter in the ladder. He said, well, of course there is, all ladders chatter. Um, <laughs> We, they found that the maintenance records were incomplete. Um, it, we, can, we cannot know for sure if the preventative maintenance in recent years was performed according to the schedule. Um, there was no uh, recommendation by any expert to take the machine out of service. And ultimately the machine was completely repaired. Um, the hydraulics were, were fixed. It was a very simple thing, that it, and really the problem with the hydraulics amounted to uh, lack of maintenance. No pan, basically, and a couple of leaky valves. It was fixed for a slightly under 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 fourteen thousand dollars. When we add the cost of uh, having the uh, Sutphin technician come out from Ohio to examine the machine in May. The total cost of putting this machine back in service was only fifteen thousand dollars, all in. The machine is in service today. It works fine. It is getting older, uh, and I will quote uh, Chairman Richard Thode's comment to me the day he delivered the report. He said, uh, "The town of Bethel does need to look at replacing this truck, but not tomorrow morning. You've got time. Uh, it takes uh, eight to twelve months to build a new truck if you order one from scratch." But we have plenty of time to, uh, to do that. According to the original schedule from 2006, we're right on time. There was no, ultimately, there was no reason to remove the truck from service. And it brings up, uh, the whole episode brings up a lot of troubling questions in terms of how we, uh, how we manage our fire apparatus. Uh, Bethel is an, well, Bethel is not too unusual. We have two independent volunteer fire companies. Many smaller towns are, are similar. Um, fire companies, uh, independent fire companies are not licensed by the town. They are licensed only by the state through the Office of Emergency Management Services. Uh, they are granted their, what's called their PSA, their public service area by the state of Connecticut, not by the town. But um, the, the Bethel Fire, the two independent companies get a lot of tax dollars. Uh, from uh, taxpayers. Taxpayers, uh, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen the posts uh, that had gone up on social media. They said they want our firefighters to have the best. They want them to be safe. They want them to have the equipment they need to do the job they need for us. I think everybody would agree with that. However, 
we need to have some assurance that our tax dollars are being spent appropriately and wisely. And most of all, we need to have a fleet maintenance program that um, not only makes sure that these multi-million dollars worth of equipment that we have are being maintained properly and that they are safe and that we do get the full lifespan out of them, but we also need to know that um, the apparatuses are being purchased for the good of the entire town, not one department, because even though we have two departments, we are one town and mutual aid uh, occurs on every single call. So we need to avoid that situation where because we bought an apparatus for one department, now the other department wants something like it too. We need to look at it holistically, not only as one town, but also as a region, coordinate with our neighboring towns. All the towns around us have multiple towers. Um, it, it, now, it, it makes sense that we have our own. Uh, it probably makes sense that at some point as the Stony Hill region continues to grow and we put larger buildings out there with bigger setbacks, that they would need their own tower apparatus as well. But we also need to coordinate regionally and make sure that we're not simply duplicating very expensive uh, equipment unnecessarily. So I am going to, at the end, at the conclusion of this meeting, I'm going to um, email a copy of this report. It's a 34 page report that was accepted by the uh, apparatus committee just, just, just last week and forwarded to me. I'm gonna send that to Mr. Manfreda and he can share it with the group. Um, the bottom line here is, uh, as the Board of Selectmen said just about an hour or so ago, is we need to form a relationship uh, and define it legally between the town of Bethel and its, and its fire companies. When I looked at, uh, at other towns, we're the only town I could find that doesn't define its relationship. Uh, we, I, in my opinion, and I, and I know that Rich uh, Straten and Paul Zakowski are in agreement on this, it's time that we form uh, some kind of an entity, probably a fire commission, to not only review apparatus purchases, to maintain the fleet records and make sure that they're maintained. And by the way, that's state law. There is a violation of law here because not all of the maintenance records could be located for this machine. Um, but we need to make sure that um, an, a, a third party is looking over the operations and making sure that all of these purchases, uh, not only with the apparatuses, but with the overall budget, because the three of us sitting on the board of selectmen and I, and I think uh, on the board of finance, uh, Brian, you, you're, you're a police officer. You probably have more involvement with, with apparatuses, but I can, I'm certainly not going to tell you, I know what a fire department needs. You know, we have to, we have to have a trust relationship that makes this work. And I think the time has come that we encode in law some kind of an entity, probably a fire commission or a fire administrator in town hall to oversee the operation. So that's my verbal report for tonight. And uh, I will entertain any questions if you have any. Okay. Any, any questions or comments from Matt? Yeah, Matt, I'll, oh, I'm, sorry, Bob. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nick. No, I just, again, Matt, I wanna congratulate you. That's how government should work. And, and I, I'm excited how it worked and it, the committee did a great job and I just want to pat you on the back again publicly. Um, I'm the first to scream, but I, I'd like to be at least the second to say good job. And again, good job, Matt. Well, you were first on that too. That's good. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, so Matt, I, you know, again, I, we all appreciate the job that you've done to lay this out and the oversight that the Board of Selectmen provided, but it is still a little, um, disconcerting the path that this went down. And obviously the need for oversight is there and there should be a commission to, um, on a go forward basis. It's just that, you know, this whole story raises a level of doubt of what is the motivation for not performing a due diligence in the first place on the, um, thought of repairing rather than replacing. It seems like uh, there's something that was caught. It was caught by the due process, but the fact that we had to catch it, I think is, is, is doesn't say much for um, the process that was in place. Yep, I agree. Uh, let me, let me um, add one other thing to this. I do not want my comments to be taken in any way as a criticism of the many, many very dedicated volunteers 
uh, for that department. There are people who put their lives on the line with every call. They do a fantastic job. We're really talking about very narrow subset here of, uh, of folks who were pushing very hard for this truck. I, I don't want that to be a reflection on the department as a whole because they don't deserve that. But uh, thank you for your comments, Robert. Well, Matt, Tom, Matt, Tom if Tim I could just continue, Matt, I'm not, I'm not accusing Tom. anybody of anything um, you know, yeah. evil because it doesn't sound like there's any real reward for doing this, but it does sound like someone acted without full, a, you know, fully investigating or a full understanding of it. And, right. and that's, that's the concern I'm raising, not, not that anybody was out to, because they want to drive around in a new truck versus a, you know, a decades old truck. Mm -hmm. May I say uh, something? Good. Can I say, I've been waiting. Hold on, Cynthia, hold I, on. I think oh, Brian, I don't, I, okay. Brian I'm there. driving. That's <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Matt. To say, as uh, you know, you know, I'm chairman of the Republican Party. I, I can assure you that it was never brought up during our campaign or the municipal election. And to be honest with you, the majority of people actually applauded you and the rest of the selectmen for putting together a commission and looking into it, rather than just jumping the gun and saying we need this now. So. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, I just I, wanted I, to make sure you knew that. That, I, that yeah, was... Thank you, Brian. I, I know that. When I, when I said that there was political pressure, I was talking about uh, comments in the community on a website that, that oh, okay. questioned. So it had nothing to do with the parties whatsoever. So yep. yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure you knew that was never yeah. the majority yeah. of the everyone was happy that you and the selectmen did what you did. Right. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Yeah. OK, so, you know, um, me too, me too, because I wanted to say the same thing. And I think, but and to, to uh, Robert's point, um, it, it, it's because, you know, I'm naturally suspicious. It makes me wonder because, um, I mean, that was a great catch, but it shouldn't have been a catch. And um, especially just the whole, you know, uh, the whole delta in the, in the cost from 1.7 million to whatever it costs to repair it. But it makes me think that anything that involves that kind of um, equipment or even, you know, buildings, property. I know that there are, there's some um, oversight in place, but there has to be, it seems like there would have to be some sort of um, standardized way or pro of programming the stuff. And, and again, I do want to say that was great. I was, I went to that uh, selectman meeting where it was discussed and I, I was very happy at that report. I thought it was really good. So thank you, Matt. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Right, I guess I have, looks like I'm going to have the final comment here. Matt, I do want to just thank you for your efforts here. Um, you know, this, in my mind, was all based on your experience, right? You were the first one to raise to me the issue and then the thought about how to proceed forward. And I thought, again, that that was the right approach and you came to that approach based on your experience of governing this town over a long period of time. Often experience yields efficiencies and gains that are difficult to quantify. Uh, this is an example of where the leadership, the experience and the benefit that came to the town from it was starkly obvious, right? Just rounding $1.7 million. So I, again, um, on, you know, individually on behalf of the entire Board of Finance, I want to thank you again, uh, congratulate you on the experience that you had that you brought to, the, to this question and, and dealing with it. it. It is really that your efforts saved this town $1.7 million. So, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Now, now, keep in mind, we do have to buy a new truck, but not this year. <laughs> Understood. And, and this yep. board has got a plan for, you know, putting savings account. Right. The annual savings to get there. So uh, we're, we're all on board with that. Always best to buy something tomorrow as opposed to today. If, if yes. You can do so safely. So, so thank you. All right. Moving on to the next agenda item. I see Dr. Carver, Terry just showed up visually. So uh, we'll turn it over to the team for an update on the board of finance from the board of finance. Excuse me, board of ed, thanks. 
Um, so Bob, I don't know, is Dion going to share the presentation yes. or should I? I have okay. it. Yep, I have it. Excellent. And while Dion's gearing it up, I also want to point out that Melanie O'Brien is also on the call, our chair of the Board of Ed and uh, Bill Foster, Board of Ed member. Um, so um, Mr. Manfreda asked us to uh, come to you tonight and talk a little bit about the impact that COVID has had on the school system, specifically related to the finances of, of, of um, or the impact that it's had to the finances of the school system. And um, I wanna start by saying, I'm, I, my intent is not to go through our whole reopening plan um, because that could probably take three or four hours. And many of you already heard my presentation because you're parents in the district. Um, so, um, uh, you know that it's a pretty extensive process that we've been going through over the past um, several years. Um, so Deanna, if you could flip to that next slide. I know it's a PDF. <laughs> so our intent tonight is to cover a couple of different things. One, because, I th that because we think that they're interconnected. The first is to talk about kind of what happened in the spring of 2020 when we transitioned from um, being in school on March, I think March 12th, and being on distance learning for the remainder of the school year, and the impact that it had on the finances of the, the Board of Ed. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about some unexpected expense or unanticipated expenses that we had, and then talk a little bit about some remaining um, funds as a result of that. Um, and then uh, immediately after that, kind of jump into the 2020-21 school year, and talking a little bit about some of the funding sources that are coming to the district, um, not only from our own budget, but from the, the both the state and the federal government. Talk a little bit about like where we see the executive orders going for the, the coming year, and then just what we've had to do just to open schools and the impact that it's had financially on the, sy the system. And as I think we all know, this is a very, very fluid situation. Um, I think that we get I, I know for a fact we get daily, sometimes hourly updates um, in terms of guidance and expectations um, in terms of what we're supposed to um, do to, so that we can welcome our students back on September 8th and everybody's safe, um, both students and staff. So Dion, if you could flip to that next slide. So before we jump into that, I, I do want to talk briefly about enrollment. And I know this is a message that I keep harping, but it's even more, um, I think, crucial than ever. Um, right now, I think when we, pr we presented to the Board of Finance last year, we were a little bit over 3,100 students. We're now over 3,200 um, students in the district. Now that number's fluid, and that was as of 817, which is I think today. Um, and we do expect adjustments to that enrollment. Um, but in the past, I would say month to two months, we've seen a huge increase in the number of students that are registering for the district. And I think it's a direct reflection, because I know you're going to ask me that. Uh, why are we seeing that? Um, we do seem. Um, to be getting a lot of people that are buying houses in Bethel, a lot of implants from New York. Um, and I, 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 you know, I wonder um, if it's a reflection of COVID, the ability to work remotely and not having to be in the city every day and all the impacts that it have, being in a large city and, and, and a virus has had. Um, but that being said, um, so I, I think I, a board member asked me today, what, what's the increase overall? Since I started working in Bethel, which this is my seventh school year, we've seen about 400 more students. It's roughly just over 400 more students. Um, so it's significantly over the projected amount, um, but it certainly increased over time. So of that, when we start in this fall, and again, this number is a little fluid too, because um, we do, today was the deadline to cut off whether or not you wanted to, to, to go on distance learning. We are seeing about 492 students um, that are, uh, whose parents are opting, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little in the future slide, who are opting to put their students on distance learning for the coming school year, which represents about 15% of our total school population um, in terms of next year. So Dion? Yep. 
Um, we also got some recent information in terms of our per pupil expenditure um, for the town. Um, and this is published just always a year or two behind, but this is the most recent information. Um, so the average in the state, state of Connecticut for per pupil expenditures is now about um, 17,000, it's not about, it's $17,506. In Bethel, um, if you look at the same year in terms of our own spending, we're spending about $1,500 a student uh, less than the average in the state. And if you looked at it regionally, there's even a larger discrepancy in terms of our, our overall spending. And right now we're actually ranked 100, 150th in spending for 169 towns. Um, so I thought that was important just to, to update you on, but we'll jump into the whole COVID thing now. So, um, and I'm going to ask Terry to jump in on this part of conversation. So I just want to set a little context. You probably remember at the end of, or the beginning of the, um, when we went into distance learning, there was an executive order, it was 7R, and when you get this presentation, there's actually a link directly to that. Um, and we were uh, required by the, by the governor um, to continue to pay all staff within the district. Um, and that included not only our certified and non-certified staff, but our building substitutes, our tutors, our recess and lunch monitors. Um, and um, uh, the only ones that were really excluded, I believe, were building subs. Correct, Terry? The daily, the daily subs. Right. If it was a building sub that comes every day, we were to pay them. But a daily sub that subs on and off, we were not required to pay. Um, we were also required by order of this executive order to preserve our transportation services and our special education providers. And so the reasoning behind that was if school were to suddenly open up um, after a month of being on distance learning, they wanted to make sure that we had the employees, uh, i.e. the bus drivers and the bus fleet, for our students to be able to go back and, uh, uh, and, and uh, have that service through the end of the school year. And the same was true with special education providers. Um, so we have about 17 students that are placed in private special ed facilities um, throughout the region. And um, we were, and just to provide context, I know we talk about it at budget time, but a typical special ed education student that's on an outplacement, um, Terry, what's the range between $100,000 and $200,000? Yes, and, and, and yeah. Yeah, so it's a significant amount of money uh, that we were continued to require to pay, um, even though those students were also on distance learning like our students were. And, and when, we, when we talk about some of the savings later that, we, that ended up occurring, so we saw a lot of variability in the kind of the level of programming that individualized students got. Um, but, there, but there still was a requirement on behalf of the governor that we continue to pay those contracts. Um, Terry, did you wanna add anything? Not at this point. Okay, so Deanna, if you could go to that next slide. So Terry, I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about this. So uh, you know that we flipped into distance learning very, very quickly. So within uh, three days, we went from full in-person school to full distance learning uh, in the middle of March. And um, leading up to that, we had, in order to try to stay in school, we incurred a lot of money trying to buy PPE and um, get ready for uh, going out and making sure we had enough Chromebooks and um, just all the additional cleaning and cleaning protocols and, and all of that. So we incurred money for that. Um, we had to make sure when we went out that we also had enough Chromebooks for everyone, including all the way down to first grade. And um, we... Um, Funds to cover school and cover. Yeah, so the other thing was we did have some savings. Um, we were fine with the school lunch program. So right, that, right. so that, but that's where we had some costs there. Um, so, so those are things that we weren't expecting, but at the same time, and Deanna, if you could go to that next slide. At the, at the same time, there were some expenses that we did not use um, yes. because, because of the fact that we went into COVID quickly. 
And, um, and you can see that there was about $197,000 in supplies that included professional development, curriculum supplies, things that happened in the building level, um, that uh, travel conference fees, all of those pieces were kind of remaining at the end of the year that, that were not expended. And we were on distance learning, so we weren't buying things paper. like art supplies and more paper because we weren't Christine. in person. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Christine, uh, uh, Cynthia's raised her hand. Cynthia, I'm sorry, because um, I can't see anybody when I'm presenting. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Cynthia. She, uh, let me see, she might be muted. I'm not trying to do anything. I pulled over because I've lost everything. I was just trying to make my phone be louder. You know, I don't know how to do it. So I'm, I may be pushing buttons, but I don't need. Okay. 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 Dion, just stop me if somebody yep. asks a question because I can't yep. see. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, if you go to the, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so it also, then, yeah. uh, yes, we were talking about transportation. Um, in addition, um, we were able to negotiate with a bus company and Mitchell Oil. Um, so yes, we were we were required to pay the contract um, services for them, but through negotiations with the bus company, there were some expenses that we were able to negotiate back in savings. Terry, do you want to add on to that? Certainly. Uh, so um, if you read the details of, of Executive Order 7R, it said that you had to uh, keep some expenses included in what you paid. But we clearly didn't feel that if you're not running the buses, uh, the state after several webinars with the state financial people, they said, no, if you want to negotiate out what you believe to be their profit, um, and then there were things we didn't run also. So we had negotiations. There were some things we didn't run at all, like some extracurricular things we didn't run. And, um, and Mitchell Oil worked well with us. And again, this, uh, the SPED runs, it was SPED runs as well as the regular bus runs. Right. And, then, and, and, and athletics too. Um, and athletics didn't and run in the spring. Right. The tuition, so you remember, yeah, the tuition for SPED, I have to say our, uh, our PPS uh, director, she... Uh, worked with the 17 different outplacements and made sure that children were receiving as best a quality education as they could get, uh, considering distance learning was in place, the same as if they were with us on distance learning. But there were a few instances where uh, at, in discussions, she was able to find out that certain, certain services could not be provided, and then they did take them out of what they were filling up. So that was the same thing. Right. Right. So, so that that's oh, Deanna, if you go to the next slide. Yep. So that before we go into 2020 this year, does anybody have questions about last year? I do. Yes. Can you see me? I can, Brian. Yes. All right. I, you know, I just have a question because you know I had brought it up during the budget presentations. Were there going to be any savings as a result to COVID? And the answer was no. And just adding up those three lines, it comes out to 555000 in savings. So I'm just curious, like, what happened? Well, a lot of it got negotiated after the budget was passed. So to be clear, so the whole thing with the bus company, am I wrong, Terry? It was after, it was, it was I don't know, sometime in May. That, that, that is true. And the slide before it showed additional, expenses. I tried to highlight the, the, the major areas of additional expense and the major areas of saving. Right. So if you right. net those, at the end of the fiscal year, on June 30th, when we ran our, what are completely unaudited, not finished closing out numbers, we were at 343,000 remaining in the budget. What right. I will say, Brian, is less than 1%, and we are two thirds of the town budget overall. And I, I think on the town side, there were savings also. So it's not unusual. We always do end up positive. We try very hard. I don't think I've ever been negative. Uh, so, um, and some of it was so fluid, we just really didn't know until we got to the end. Another right. thing that did happen was, you know that we ran the, um, the seamless summer option that we were 
given a waiver to run for the for the uh, school lunch program. And at the time, I will say I had an estimate in there that we could easily have lost about $100,000 in that program. Right. We had such participation in that program and we did receive federal reimbursement for every meal we served and the, the school lunch program ended up covering itself where I was concerned all along that if we're paying all the salaries and we really don't have the revenue that we wouldn't come out ahead. But, and I didn't know that until we kept going along and that program kept growing and growing and it not only covered itself, it provided a great service um, in the town. I, so. I, guess, I, I guess for me, the, the the only point, and you guys know I, I have great respect for both of you. Yeah, yeah. Just in the future, I'd prefer we don't know rather than saying absolutely no savings. That's yeah. all. Just we yeah. don't know. Well, you know? <laughs> that's all another, I'm saying. Another thing that we didn't anticipate, Brian, is that there were a lot of like software programs that we ended up using that mm -hmm. were that we thought we were going to have to pay for, and they turned out to be that at least last fall, they're not free anymore we thought we were going to have software expenses that our children were going to use as part of the distance learning that were pretty substantial um and a lot of uh, a lot of um um uh, a lot of the vendors yeah just yeah. gave it to school districts across the country um uh, now they're charging us but it <laughs> was it was uh it was kind of a thing that we didn't anticipate because we thought we were going to have to pay it all of a sudden with buying all this technology and not sure whether or not we'd be back in a month and have to provide PPE for everybody. So, but I, I do hear you. I do hear right. you. I take, I take your comment very seriously. Thank um, you. Well, so, uh, um, Barbara, I, I would just yeah. add, add to that or build on to that. We as a board and the town, I think, is we're going to have to become comfortable with that kind of a dynamic fluid right. situation for the rest of the year. When, when folks ask you all perhaps for hard answers, the response may be, we don't have them. We're going to have to see how things unravel, <laughs> unfold as opposed to unravel, right? Um, right. I, I do think it's going to be important that we've got identified all the levers. Right? We may not know how those level, levers finally position out, but I do think we're, and this is the beginning of that process, right? You're coming and talking to us and we'll do this on a regular basis, but we'll identify those levers so that we can at least put some collar around what we think the up and downsides are of, of getting this done. But I, I don't want, Brian's talking about last year. I want to make sure that we know for this year, tremendously fluid situation, always changing, and we're, it's, it's hard, right? Change and uncertainty is difficult for folks. We're gonna to have to all help each other kind of get comfortable with it. Right. Can I jump in here a minute, Bob? Sure. Again, we were all sitting at this Board of Finance meeting, listening to all the presentations, and yes, the virus did hit, but immediately everybody said, no, 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 we're spending more money. If I listened to every word, if someone just said, we're just not sure here, then I could swallow the three or four or 500,000 that automatically after everything was done, now we have it in savings. So I really have a problem with that. So if, if you just had a left and out that said, you know what, we're gonna talk to the bus companies, we're gonna talk to Mitchell and maybe there'll be something. All of you sat in front of us and said, no, 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 there's no savings. And by the way, we're spending more money so that's where my big rub is. If someone shows and tells me what they need, not what they want, I'll give anybody anything. But when, when I'm misled by a statement because I listen, that's where I have my big rub. If Terry, if you just said, we're going to try, we'll get back to you in a month or two, then I would be more open to it. But when we were getting no, 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 we're spending more, that's where my problem, I have a big rub with that. Well, Nick, I'm going to correct something there. There was a projection on that sheet that we would be negotiating with the bus company and we would be negotiating for fuel. And we thought we might have some savings from not running, not running the spring sports. However, we were also spending a lot of money at that time 
and we didn't really know what it was going to take to get through the rest of the year. Right. Okay. Nor, nor, nor did we go out in June and use all that money because. No, but that, that, again, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm new at this, but you, when you hand something an hour and a half before a meeting like this presentation and then say, I listen to, I listen to what you guys say more than these presentations and you and Dr. And I, Bob Gimonero, you all said, no, 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 we're spending more. So if you're telling me I should have read it, give it to me in, uh, an hour and a half, uh, a little more earlier than an hour and a half before a meeting. So whatever you guys ask for later, it's going to be no from me. I'm a no. Well, hold on. Look, let, I think the takeaway from this is, again, we're going to all have to get comfortable with the fluid nature. And, and Dr. Carver and Terry, again, you know, we, we understand how fluid it is. And I do, I, I agree with the sentiment, saying I don't know is, is not a weakness. Uh, so let's, let's go forward from, from here and let's see what you got for 20, okay. 2020, 2021, understanding again that it's, it's changed daily. Well, let me start by saying I don't know and it's fluid. <laughs> um, but here's what, I, here's what we're required to do. So I just think it's important to put context around things again. So the state is requiring um, districts to come up with, not only come up with, but be able to implement any of these three phases of, um, of uh, schooling based on the, the community mitigation of COVID. And so we are required in all of those phases uh, whether it's full in person, a hybrid model, or distance learning, which is where we were last spring, something that no other school district has ever had to do before across the country. So it's not just Bethel, but across the country. Um, and so what happened was, um, so it, in that, we also have to provide an option for families who choose not to send their children to school um, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to be on distance learning. So not only do we have to provide a program in school, we have to provide a full robust program outside of school um, so that students have that option if, if families choose not to send their, their child to school. And again, we're at about 15% of the total population that has chosen that. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into all the three phases, I'm just gonna kind of talk about the economic impact. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Dr. Carver, just, just for a second, I'm yeah. sorry. But it sounds like you all know it's going to be either two or three. So we are starting, I mean, in terms of what we're actually going to do? Yeah, right, because we right. know 15% are going to do remote. Right. So what we are planning now is called transition to full. Um, so just like businesses started opening slowly and, you know, got used to implementing all of the mitigation strategies, so are the schools. So we're gonna start in a hybrid for the first two weeks of school. Now we don't go back till September 8th um, because of the school construction projects. So um, on, assuming that all of the mitigation strategies work, um, we don't have any positive cases and the community mitigation is where it is now. Um, it is my intent that we're gonna go back full elementary um, on September 29th. So with um, a group on distance learning. In the meantime, between those two dates, we're gonna do two, essentially two weeks of a hybrid. Um, and then for the middle school, we are going to do the same thing, except we're just gonna wait one more week and we're gonna be full on October 5th. The most complex issue or the most complex school, and this is true of any um, high school across the state of Connecticut, to try to implement these four major mitigation strategies is the high school. And it's because at a high school, you don't have the ability to um, create cohorts like you do at an elementary uh, school. So in essence, what's going to happen is, and I'll go through these as we're talking. Um, so right now the, the high school is on a hybrid and um, we're trying to identify a date where we can bring the high school back full. I'm hoping it's sometime in October, um, but it really based on, uh, uh, based on how we kind of re-enter school and, um, and uh, implement these strategies. So the first thing that we are required to do is cohort students. Um, so what that means at elementary is that essentially what would happen is a student would stay in their class for the majority of the day. And instead of going out into um, other spaces, 
the, the people that work with the children um, um, will come in and um, provide their specials, their special education services in some cases, their intervention services, but they'll come into that main group and those children will stay together over the, over the course of the day. Um, so they won't go to lunch. We, we, they have their lunches delivered into the classroom. Um, we are looking at, uh, and we have, we are creating outdoor classrooms and outdoor spaces because the, the guidelines really um, emphasize that as much as you can do outside, um, it's better. Just like, just like when we go to restaurants, you know, most of this, the, the um, restaurants are outdoor and they're seating. Um, so that has the kind of the same benefits, but we can't even send groups of kids into the playground together um, because we have to um, because we can't have cohorts mix between students the whole idea is that, that there is a positive case then what you can do instead of quarantining the whole school you can look at smaller groups to be able to, to quarantine so that's the idea behind it um, the other thing that we had to do is we had to create enough spaces throughout our schools so that we can maintain social distancing. Um, and we're following the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines between three and six feet. Um, but the reality is, is in most cases, with the amount, when you take out the students that are on distance learning, um, in most cases, we were able to um, get to between five and six feet in classrooms, which is good because that's a positive mitigation strategy. But we also had to do lots of work to our facilities, um, our ventilation system, enhancing our, um, our cleaning protocols in buildings, um, making sure that we had adequate supplies for all classrooms. Because if you can imagine, like in the, my high school example, and I, I told my families and teachers this, it's like going to the gym. You know, if you've been back to the gym, you have to wipe down all your equipment um, and then you, you use it and then you have to wipe it all down again before you leave. So our high school students, uh, as, as well as our custodians are going to have to uh, do that and implement that. So we also had to provide a lot of, um, uh, Terry help me, plexiglass barriers yes. in different spaces where um, the public would interact with staff. So just like a town hall, and if you go to um, a store, you have a, a, a plexiglass barrier between um, that person and whoever is interacting with them in the public. So all of our offices spaces had to be retrofitted. We also had to completely renovate it, all of our nurses offices. Now the good news is, is that at um, um, Johnson and Rockwell School, they were actually being built that way. Um, but we have to create isolation spaces within the buildings um, with very special uh, protocols so that if a child or a staff member does get sick, that we have a way to isolate them from the rest of the school. And, um, and, and then we have a series of protocols that we would implement uh, to do that. But the bottom line is that it caused a lot of facilities renovation issues. Um, in terms of transportation, um, there's enhanced cleaning procedures um, that have to occur. And Terry's been working with the bus company on that. We also have, uh, this doesn't cost anything, but we have had to, we actually cohorted our students down to their bus route. So that, um, that if, if, if we go to half capacity or hybrid, um, that we reduce the number of students on the bus, that's the whole point of it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we, but we were able to successfully do that. And then the last thing is PPE or face coverings. So not only do we have to have masks available um, for our staff, we've, we've purchased um, cloth masks. Um, we've purchased each staff member two cloth masks, but we also have to have available to our staff um, the, the disposable, uh, 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 oh my God, the surgical masks. Um, we also have had um, uh, gowns, uh, face shields. Um, we've even um, had to purchase, um, uh, like, Terry, what are they called? The plexiglass shields on the, the desk? desk? The student desk shields. So right. K-8, every student desk has a student desk shield on it. It's a three, uh, you know, three-sided uh, uh, right. desk. And uh, yeah, and that's also because lunch, lunch, they're going to eat lunch at their desk um, and Take we have their masks off. with their masks off at that right. point in time. 
So that, so that was another thing that we had to add that had a tremendous expense. Um, so, so I'm, I'm just kind of surfacing a lot of these things, but they, and, uh, and then obviously to maintain technology, we also have to ensure, again, all of our students have devices and we had a replacement cycle that we had to meet for the coming school year. Again, adding first grade, as Terry already mentioned, um, into our one-to-one -one model because we were only one-to-one -one in grades two through 12. Um, and, and Dr. Carver, now we're down all the way to kindergarten. Right, right, right. And so, um, so we're looking at, um, and then programs that we need. We also have to um, ensure that our families have connectivity. So that was another thing that we had to survey our parents. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit when we talk about the CARES Act, about how we can provide some of that to, to our families. But if you don't, so there's two issues. One is you don't have connectivity at all. You don't have internet at home. But secondly, um, we had to provide, um, um, uh, so if you're running multiple video streaming services in your home, you're in, you're, you don't have a strong, uh, uh, I don't know what the term is, connectivity, um, then it can drain the system. So, um, and kids won't be able to engage in synchronous learning throughout the day. Um, so all of those issues are things that we've had to work out in addition to providing, um, buying a lot of software application programs that uh, we think we're gonna need for the coming school year, especially as we enhance our programs for distance learning um, uh, going forward. So th that's kind of like the broad bush of like big time, bigger expenses um, that I think that were worth mentioning. Terry, do you want to add anything? Yeah, also, I think you mentioned it, but we had to make sure that we had increased our connection through SEN because now you're streaming from every classroom out to homes. So right. our, our broadband wouldn't, wouldn't handle all of that with every single classroom streaming out. So we had to upgrade that. And one of the other large expenditures we had to look at was an entire addendum came out that, re, that addressed ventilation in systems in schools. Right. And so we had to go through and we had to do some, um, uh, some more preventative maintenance. We had to do some additional cleaning of some venting, vent systems. And, um, and we're working closely with the renovation projects to make sure that they are opening under the right, the right protocols for ventilation in your building. So if you go to the next slide, and then I'll take, yeah, I can take a question. Before we move on? Yep. I think you said that we're going to try to get back to normal by October 8th or something, right? No, I, what I said was, is it's our hope um, that, that by September 29th, we will have all of our, our pre-K-5 um, to school uh, five days a week, right? And then it's our hope by October 5th that we will have grades six through eight also in school five days a week. Okay. With, all, with all the protocols still right, in right, place. Right. It. And I get it, but it, it's, it seems like we're doing, uh, and you two are, are, are sound like you're doing a great job, but you're doing a ton of work for three weeks worth of school. Why don't we just all wait until October 1st and go and go back to these normal, I mean, yeah. you're, you're putting the sneeze shields on everybody's desks. No, um, it's, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. We have to implement these protocols regardless if kids are in hybrid or they're in for full time. So all of the requirements are, are based on um, any attendance within the schools. Unless you stay outside during the winter. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, so it, all protocols had to be in place. Right. All the infrastructure had to be done. Right. Whether you had, because, because whether you have half of your students in at a time or you have full amount of students in, it you all have had to, to have. Done it all has to be the same way. You also have to simultaneously offer, offer distance learning and you have to stream the distance learning to whoever chose distance learning and that's 15% of our population. Go ahead, Nick. I have a question. I'm sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Nick. Yep. So October 5th, everybody's coming back to school, say in fifth grade, and they're still gonna have lunch at their desks? Yes. Okay. So that makes right. sense. 
Yes, yes. The protocols have to, I should have been clear, the protocols have to be in place regardless of, of, of who's going to be back. The, the added challenge, quite frankly, is what Terry just said. Not only do we have to do that, but we have to teach a whole group of kids that are at home. <laughs> so, um, which, which I think I'm really proud of um, what, we're, what we're doing. And, and then for certain classrooms, we didn't even get into this, but for certain special ed classrooms, and Nick, I know you know, <laughs> but we have to actually enhance the PPE based on children's disabilities. Um, and so for our staff that work in um, uh, more severe and profound populations, um, the requirements are even more stringent. So, Deanne, if you go to the next slide. Christine, I wanted to just say, some things we're saying sound very simple. All kids are gonna eat in their classroom. All kids are gonna eat in their classroom is a major logistical <laughs> feat yeah. of, of, of uh, you know, carts and people that are bringing, you know, not only making the food and then getting the food to every classroom and then getting the garbage back out of every classroom. It's, it's um, the, the amount of logistics behind each of these things is, is um, amazing. We even have to put signage up in the building so like just like when you go i always use dick sporting goods because they have pretty good signage but like you know when you go to the grocery store and you see like you have to walk in certain directions you have to have certain signs up you have to have uh, six foot markers all of those little details and pieces have been tremendously um, uh, intense. Um, so we, I'm gonna just summarize and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the survey that the state made us, uh, well, they didn't make us fill out, the survey the state asked us to fill out um, and the commitment that we see from the state level to help um, offset some of these costs. But um, Terry already talked about, we had a big increase in our, our, our SEND bill, which is provides the Wi-Fi coming into the building because we had to expand the, ba the bandwidth so that um, you could site you could stream essentially you know three to four hundred well about 300 staff members at the same time potentially and kids on their computers and their devices um, we've we talked a lot about um, getting cleaners masks shields um, we have we we luckily and a lot of districts are struggling with this right now I know our neighbors in Brookfield are um, we because we bought our devices early some people can't get Chromebooks right now they can't get the PPE um, but we we were able to secure a good, uh, uh, I'm going to call it stockpile because it almost is, um, of like um, uh, surgical masks and things like that. Because if hand sanitizer, sanitizer you can't time, even get soap, you can't no. even get pump soap, no. soap in a, on a wall. It, it, and, and plexiglass is like toilet paper right now. I mean, it's just really, really hard to get. Um, so we, we have to redesign our whole meal program for next year because not only do we have to provide a meal for our free and reduced lunch students in school, we're also required um, to provide those uh, lunches for students that are on distance learning. Um, so it's a kind of a combination. We've actually even gotten some tents, like pop-up tents. They're, they're a little bit nicer than pop-up tents, but because we want to make sure that kids are not stuck in their room all day and they have opportunities to go outside and get fresh air and to have mask breaks. Um, so we talked about the, re the renovation works. Um, and then um, we're, we're definitely going to address and we anticipate that we're going to have increased costs and overtime for our custodians um, and, and possibly um, um, uh, you know, bringing Tech, in technology, services, our technology right. folks. Yeah, so they have just been uh, right. working almost around the clock. The so if you go to the next slide, Dion, I'll explain the 401 later. Um, so, so what, what, where's, where's part of this money coming from is I'm sure part of your question. So the governor has committed. Um, so part of it is federal and part of it is coming from the state. 
they committed $266 million to help um, schools reopen. Again, some of it's coming from um, the federal government, some of it's coming from the state government. And there, 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 there are some focus areas that they are going to fund. Um, the first is in the area of PPE and cleaning, because they understand that until there's some type of vaccine, vaccination for COVID, we are going to have additional expenses um, for those two things. Um, they also, um, and one of the kind of the, I guess, unanticipated costs um, that we're seeing is that, um, that in some cases, we have staff members who may um, be ill or have a high risk condition that we're in, by which their doctor provides a note to say that they can't be in that environment. Um, and so it, it triggers the use of their sick time. So in essence, what you're doing on, in some occasions, and I'll get into this more in detail in a minute, you have to pay two people. You have to pay the teacher or the staff member who is home, you know, doing their sick, uh, you know, collecting their, um, you know, their sick uh, time, but they also, you also have to have a sub that's in the room with the students. Um, so it's, it's complex. And then I also talked about there, there is some money from the federal government um, in terms of connectivity and devices. So do, does every child in the state of Connecticut have a device if we go back on distance learning? And then if they don't have a device, do they have access to the internet? Um, so we had, to, we had to fill out a survey to kind of ascertain what, what we thought they thought our needs were. Um, but before we get into the survey, Deanna, if you can go to the next slide. In the meantime, in the late spring, and I don't even think we knew what the allocation was going to be until, I don't know, Terry, was it June? Yeah, it was yeah. late May or June that we, we were told our number, but, but it hadn't even been released. In fact, we're still waiting for final approval on the ground. Right. So you probably have heard that the federal government released something called the CARES Act. And part of the CARES Act funding was to go to school districts to help support the reopening of schools. And, um, and it's called the Corona, uh, Coronavirus Aid Relief Economic Security. Um, and it's the same act that provided small business loans and you know, different things. When we got that uh, money um, uh, initially, we, we had shared last year that we were concerned about the class size in Johnson. And we, we weren't able to fill all of the positions that we had within the budget. Um, but we knew that if we didn't uh, add back those two classroom teachers, um, which are just a one year position being funded through this CARES grant, it helped to create a smaller class sizes, which was what we were trying to achieve anyways. But with, the, with creating the ability to social distance, we didn't have, um, we, having 27 in the class would have been extremely problematic. So with the board support, the way we wrote the grant to receive the CARES Act is to, to fund those two additional uh, teachers that we had, um, that we, thought, we felt we needed, but we also use that money um, for PPE, for cleaning, and for retrofitting, whether it was our ventilation systems or um, some of the, the plexiglass barriers that we've had to put in or the... Um, the renovations of the nurse's office for the isolation spaces. Those are all kind of things that we have been using, that we have written the grant to use that funding for. So, Christine, I'd like to add to that. So sure. just, to, just to give you guys a sense of what really is happening back to logistics again. We have to position as many desks in a classroom as we can with the proper distance between them. Measuring, measuring this out, what we've had to do is remove any, any excess bookshelves, Furniture. Any, you know, beanbag, anything, you know, that kind of lives and grows in a classroom, gives it some charm. That all has been coming out, stored in these storage boxes that we've had to rent. In order for us to, when you walk in a classroom, you're going to see teacher and the amount of desks we can fit. Right. So with, without having the right number of sections for fourth and fifth grade, we could not get the class, even the desks properly because the class sizes were too big. Right. So right. that's why Dr. Carver is referring to the class size issue. And Doctor, can I jump in one second? I, I'm not real smart and I got to take this in small bites. 
So these additional two teachers this year are paid by this grant. Right. So you're not willing to give up these two next teachers for next year when a grant is over. So this is going to come back on the taxpayers. Is that correct? Well, no, Nick, we don't know that for sure. Um, because it, we, every year we evaluate our staff to see if we're allocating them uh, the most efficiently. And yes, we, they, were, they were proposed in the budget this year and they possibly could be in the budget next year. Um, but we, did, we also didn't see any other option because we couldn't get to that smaller class size um, in, in that. So I, I think that, I'm not saying no, um, but I think that uh, it was something that we advocated for last year because we felt we had a need. Now I did share with you that when you look at the bubble class moving through, the classes behind those are a little bit smaller. So it, again, we would have to look at where we fall um, overall with our enrollment and make the determination and look at how we can reallocate staff as we do every year um, before we make a determination or a specific budget recommendation. Um, but yes, but this year we felt we had to do it because, and we had the funds uh, through the CARES Act that to meet the social distancing requirements. Um, I will tell you that we are, we are um, I had a conference call today and Terry listened in on that conference call. So with the other um, remaining mon monies from the state, um, what they have said in, Dion, can you just go back for one second? So what they have said is that they're going to look at funding the PPE and cleaning and the connectivity and devices in a different way, then they are going to be reimbursing districts for the academic expenses. And the reason I bring that up is that we found out today that any reimbursement for any type of, you know, having extra teachers or extra staff members to, um, to like monitor lunches and things like that right or bus monitors that's another thing that we have to add for the beginning of the school year to ensure that our students wear their masks on the bus and, and sit in the correct seats um so uh we did not qualify um what they said on the state call today is the funding for the academics or the extra staff um was for only for school districts that had greater than 40 percent free and reduced lunch population so Bethel's at about 30. Um, so we are, I, I anticipate that we will not be eligible for any of the, those types of funds. But if you go ahead, Dee, and I'll explain what that means. So if you go two slides ahead. So we were asked in July, it was due July 17th, we were asked to submit a survey to the State Department of Education. This was even before we had our plans done. Um, they wanted to know from districts and there was um, there, and we, we talked about it with the Board of Ed and I know there were some newspaper articles about it and you heard the term $1.9 million, right? Um, that is based on the survey that we submitted to the State Department of Ed. Again, it was not, uh, it, was, uh, it was a educated guess around what we thought are were going to be expenses that we were going to occur over the course of the school year based on where we felt the situation lied at the time. And they asked us to break it down um, in these areas that you see on your screen, academics, building, student supports, um, technology and transportation. Um, and they asked us to not only tell us what we would need in terms of additional personnel cost, but also um, um, they, they asked us what we might need for um, uh, uh, non-personnel yeah, non yeah, non non -personnel things. So if you go to the next slide. So this is what we submitted at the time. Um, and Terry, do you wanna walk them through this? Certainly. So um, I, I'm gonna start uh, with, I'm gonna start from transportation and go up. So for transportation, we knew we were going to have to have bus monitors. We didn't know for how long um, on, on the bus runs because that was highly recommended by the state, what they had put out. So we put in a number we thought we might have to pay for bus monitors. And, and I did not know how much the cleaning was going to cost for the buses, so we put in an estimate for that. That's the 
75, but I can tell you now that I have real numbers, the bus cleaning is lower and the bus monitors, we can't even find enough bus monitors. So, and we're only gonna do them in the mornings and just for as many weeks as we can. So it won't be 40,000, it'll be lower than that. The technology, we knew we were going to have um, personnel overtime and I wouldn't be surprised if we end up spending a, a good chunk of that. And then on the non-personnel, that's the document cameras, the Chromebooks, uh, additional Chromebooks, uh, for wireless, the SEN upgrade, and uh, you know the whole one-to-one -one program. Um, I think we, we're relooking now at our inventory and we may be able to stretch our inventory and not spend as much on that line. The other thing is I put in encumbered state, what we have ordered, so we have ordered 42581 on that line. Uh, and that's, that happens, I can tell you that's all for non-personnel. Uh, student supports, we had put in um, 175,000 for non-personnel. And that's because with what they're doing with, with food service, I don't know what it's gonna look like. So I put, put in a projected loss. I also put in that the state really wants us to provide social emotional uh, training and support to our staff and our students. I put in an estimate for that because that wouldn't be our own personnel. It'd probably be someone we brought in. The building and, and cleaning supplies, um, that's a guess as to custodial overtime, or if we had to even bring in other service to do cleaning. Um, and the non-personnel, the non-personnel is, is all the stuff we've been talking about with you guys tonight. And you, I can tell you that out of that line, I have ordered almost $245,000. And that's all um, non-personnel that's been ordered. That's all the things we've been talking about tonight. Um, the academics is really where the wild card is. So we know that we hired, that we're hiring those two teachers. That is what I have encumbered. The rest is what was the unknown. And it really was an unknown. And talking with other business officials, other superintendents, it really was just taking our best guess. But that is the, what Dr. Carver was explaining. If if people were out either due to having getting COVID or um, if, if they had a condition that qualified them to, uh, to take a medical leave um, and then I have to replace them, I don't have two budgets for each position. I have positions budgeted one time. So uh, we took, we took a, a guess um, of 750000 I don't have the funding for that 750,000. We were just trying to, the state was trying to gather information. We took our best guess at that number. Right, and, and I just wanna reemphasize that. This was our best guess because again, we didn't even have our plan finished when we had to submit it to the state. Right. Um, and we don't know, will we have a better sense now um, yeah. of how many people were going to ask for some type of leave uh, or we'd have to replace them within the context of the classroom. Um, the state has stepped up to the plate in terms of um, loosening up requirements for certification so that we've talked about this before, that certification sometimes is hard to transfer people into different positions. So they actually are allowing us to do that now just for this one year period. Um, to, so that will be helpful to us. Um, but when, so when we submitted to this to the state, we, again, it was our best guess at what we thought that the expenses were going to incur. Um, and what, what we found out today, although I don't have it in writing, so I, I, I never like to say anything until I have it in writing, but what we found out today is that whatever we submitted for building and cleaning and PPE, so that's, well, 440 plus 125 is what, um, and, then the, the tech, and then the technology uh, issues that we submitted for, we are likely going to get an additional reimbursement. So we have the CARES Act, right? And then the, the, this second um, line, which you can't see my cursor, but the second line, um, the, the 125 and the 440 is what they said on the phone today 
we might get an additional funding to help offset the cost, right, Terry? Yes, and I don't know that it'll be all of it. I mean, they, they, we weren't 100% sure based on the way they worded it, but we will, we will get likely uh, more funding. And we were supposed to get the number Friday, and then we were again supposed to get the number today. Today, we I thought I was going to be able to come to the meeting tonight with, with the, the number. number. In so we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know. Um, so, in addition to the two twenty six, uh, it's going to be some number that we're expecting in the next day or two that we're going to know that we're going to have to help offset the costs. Again, it was it was uh, an estimate at the time based on a survey that we had to respond to fairly quickly. Um, and I think to Terry's point, I'm just going to emphasize it one more time because I think this is our last slide that um, that the um, the academics that 876 is the one that's most, um, I guess, uh, <laughs> volatile, maybe volatile. We're not volatile. sure because we, we it hasn't been played out totally. Um, you know, we have a somewhat of a sense, uh, but the laws, um, the CARES Act actual laws give a lot of latitude to employees um, in terms of uh, anything related to COVID that extends through um, December. So um, it's something that we're navigating right now, um, but it's, it's definitely um, going to be the one I think that is the most interesting that plays out. Do we have another slide, Dion? I don't think we do. I, I have a question on the, uh, on the reimbursement. Are you anticipating a 50%, uh, 75%, 10%, what's, what's the range in terms of the building, cleaning, health, PPE? Well, and they, they said on the phone, Mr. Palmer, today that whatever we submitted, we were likely going to get. Um, so but I was, I was skeptical. Yes, Terry is skeptical, and I haven't seen it. <laughs> so theoretically, um, the 440 plus 125, Terry, what is that? Well, it was more, I think, I think it was but. probably the non part What's that, Ter? Was it both personnel and non-personnel? Yes, it was both because it got it got re-emphasized after you jumped off the call. Oh. Um, so, so. <laughs> well, if it's five sixty-five, five six five hundred sixty-five thousand, in addition to the two uh, two twenty-six thousand. So that's yeah, an I mean, addition to that. Yeah. The other thing that, that we only got the 226, I was a little skeptical that we were going to get yeah. another 500,000, but we, we'll we, would, we would be very happy. And we'll let you know as soon as we know. Um, yes. The only the only other thing I would say is that we are also working with the town to because we, we can also submit some of these expenses through FEMA. Um, so we've been tracking that also, um, but that would go to the town that wouldn't go back into the Board of Ed budget, correct? Correct. Right? Correct. Right. So we so if we get additional expenses that we can charge towards that emergency, um, that we're definitely working with Tommy Gallagher and Matt um, to make sure that we're submitting those expenses also. So um, so I, I guess I'll open up to questions, and I guess Dion, you could take I, it off the screen. I have one follow up question. In terms of the academics, is that eight seventy six something that you uh, might need in? Anytime during the year that you're saying maybe in October you might need it and right. January you might need it. So it's it's not it's it's money that you anticipate in, in a kind of a, hopefully a worst case scenario. Right. And it's based on a survey that we gave our staff, Mr. Palmer, that um, those people that have high um, high risk health conditions too. Mm -hmm. um, that might be at more in risk uh, for uh, any type of exposure to COVID or would anticipate that they might request some type of leave uh, or use utilization of their sick time. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a combination of things. Uh, we had about 30 people that responded. Um, I think some of those people, I'm going to call it, got weeded out because I think they weren't really sure. Uh, they, it might have been a situation where a teacher lived with a family member that was high risk, but they themselves weren't high risk. So they just didn't, uh, so we were able to weed out some of that information. Um, and, but we do still have a handful and uh, we have a, yeah, a lot of um, uh, pregnant women. Um, and it's, it's high risk uh, to be in, they are definitely considered in the high risk category to be in that environment. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I'm not, not hearing any, Dr. Carver, I've got a request, not really a question. 
the, the numbers that you showed us were your best guess of about a month ago. So presumably you'll be updating them right. soon to the extent you can share the revised numbers, uh, maybe at a future meeting. Uh, I think that would be helpful just to kind of help us frame it and to kind of get a sense for what's going on. We'll, we'll have to do the same with Bob Kay on the town side at some point. Great. We're, ha we're happy to do that. All right. And Bob, if I can add, instead of, and I know Dion does a great job, but instead of getting the thing at 530, a day before a meeting, especially if we have to make decisions on something, you know, for some people it takes longer to understand things and sometimes I have to read it twice. So 530, I don't have enough time to read it before a meeting. So if we can get whatever you're trying to get us to understand earlier, uh, Bob just said that a month ago you had something, but if we can get it earlier so we can all see it and have more time with it. The presentation that, that you just went over, I would have liked to look at it longer, but I got it at 5.30 on an email today. That we, we, get, we get your point and we, I, that's well taken. I think our intent tonight was we were coming to present, so we weren't really thinking we're to not, send we were ahead, not, but, Yeah, we weren't yeah. asking for any action. Um, right, uh, but, um, it's, but I think we can take that, yeah. Right, it's to keep you informed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Carver, Terry, Melanie, I say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for, uh, for the presentation, very helpful. You're obviously wel welcome to stay. Our last agenda item is the comptroller's report. <laughs> I, I don't think you need us. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. And we, we definitely do have to keep you informed during this year, because yeah. this is, this is uh, very fluid. And I probably will know in the next day or so about the, I hope, about the additional funds and I will definitely forward it to you. Yeah, that'd be helpful. I, I had a boss one time say that, you know, changes, uncertain information, it's not like wine. It, it doesn't get better with time. No, and, and, I, and if I could just emphasize too something that you said, Mr. Manfreda, every day we get more guidance. Like it's incredible. <laughs> and so like one day we're playing football, the next day we're not playing football. Like, I mean, like masks, no masks, uh, face shields. I mean, it is like, it's, it is, I've never in my entire life had a situation where, where things are happening so quickly. And uh, so we appreciate your patience because it is, it is Looneyville. And I'll leave with the one, one other statement. It is very likely, because I asked the question, that if we do go into distance learning again, that all of the governor's executive orders that were in effect last spring could be extended again. The requirement to pay all of our employees, keep all our contracts, things like that. So that's something that we just have to keep in mind too. Sure. And okay. like Dr. Carver, we, we understand these are very uncertain, trying times. Um, but I don't think we're, we, we're confident that you are at the helm, right? There are other things that are keeping us awake at night, uh, not, not your all's ability to deal with this. So to you, Dr. Carver, Terry, and, and Melanie, you and the board, thank you. We appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for the job you're doing. Really appreciate right. it. Well, if you have any questions, just don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Next and final agenda item, controller's report to you, Bob. Oh, we need uh, Bob unmuted. Okay. Uh, I included uh, the report with the agenda when it was sent out the other day. So um, you've got the two page summary and then the Munis report following it. Um, I just want to point out the Munis report ties into these reports. Um, however, the, the revenue that we collected, the $18.8 .8 million, the actual collection was a little bit higher because we don't have everything posted to the system yet. We actually have close to uh, a little over $20 million that was um, uh, collected for the month of July, which um, is excellent. Uh, I, I, I didn't expect us to be in this uh, position. Um, it makes the total collection of um, personal property tax, car taxes, and real estate taxes at 30.38% at this point. And last year, talking to Ann, the tax collector, last year we were at 29.54. So we're up 
three quarters of a point or so, which is really good. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, total, you know, according to the report here, total collections, including the other um, items that we received were like conveyance taxes and, and permits and fees uh, added up to $19 million. Uh, the expenses this, this month were $5,469,000. Uh, a couple of the big ones are the insurance that we have to pay. And a lot of the insurance, like I've said in the past, gets paid up, um, not on a monthly basis, but uh, more so over the first eight or nine months of the year. Uh, debt service, we had debt service that came due in July of $1.6 million. Um, and uh, so town insurance and employee benefits, those are the two items that, that you, you, you're paying more currently. The other items are pretty much in order. I mean, uh, the bulk of them are salaries and wages. Um, nothing appears to be out of whack at this point. It's only one month. So, I mean, we're, we're fine, but I was really excited to see that um, the amount of uh, the real estate collections and the deferrals, we had deferrals in um, the fourth quarter of about 190,000, I believe it was 195. And going into the first quarter, we had upwards of around a little shy of 250,000, not much more. Uh, I, I thought there was going to be a lot more people deferring their taxes, and that didn't happen. And just to see the amount of money that we did collect, uh, you know, 30% um, compared to 29% last year, 1% or three quarters of a percent higher, uh, that's pretty good in the, in, in the atmosphere that, that we're experiencing right now. So um, that's about it that I have. If we, if we were to think about it in terms of the collection rate, right, which we we kind of think about. I know you explained it's hard to do an apples to apples because the personal property tax comes in one time. Mm -hmm. but, but it sounds like we're we're holding the high collection rate of ninety nine plus percent. I, I would say so. I mean, when when you look at it and, and you see thirty percent, you say, "Wow!" You know, if you took your your real estate taxes and divided the budget by you know four, we should only collected twenty five percent of it. Well. Like, like you just mentioned, we're also collecting in the first month. We're, we're one of the few towns that collects car taxes and personal property tax only at once, once during the year. Other towns do it four times during the year. So um, yeah, our rate for the month of July is gonna be higher. Um, August, July and August together may show a different story, but I think we're still gonna be up there, I, you know, if you project it out. I asked Ann about that and she says she really doesn't keep records from year to year as far as, you know, um, projecting that 99% number out. Um, but again, I mean, at 30.38, you know, compared to last year's 29, I mean, we're in a really good situation. Right. I mean, she's been doing this a long time, right? So, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, we're in really, you know, she was surprised too that, you know, we're collecting as much as we are. I really thought that we were going to get a huge deferral until October for three months. And then, you know, people would have to, you know, either pay up at that point or become delinquent, you know, at 18%. But still, um, you know, there's very few, very few uh, deferrals. Mm -hmm. So, so as revenues are concerned, a little bit of a sigh of relief as to the July 1st payment. And now we wait to see what happens with the October 1st collected October 31st. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I mean we'll watch it this month too you know, just to make sure that, you know, it doesn't drop off. But I would, you know, if they're paying now, um, the, the rest is just going to be delinquent taxes that she's going to collect for the, the other months because she's pretty much collected what she had to collect, you know. There may be some delinquencies, but very small, you know. I just, wonder, I just wonder what, you know, we had the $600 federal unemployment insurance plus up expire. To, to what degree was that helping people stay liquid? Um, now the 600 is 300, right, from the federal level. Mm -hmm. Just curious as to whether that's going to cause. You know, I don't, I don't know, Bob. I, I think if somebody had to use that $600 for either food or pay their taxes, they probably would pay the rent and food before they're going to pay their taxes or their mortgage payments, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Now that that 600 is not there, you chop out the bottom thing, which is the rent right. or, yeah. or rent in this instance. And the landlord gets stuck having a floor for liquidity. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Uh, Bob, what's going on with the Berkshire Hathaway uh, tax situation? I think at this point they're uh, they're going for the appeal. They're working on that, but there's um, I haven't received any information on that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, comments for Bob? I'll, I'll jump in. Bob, the school had a, a, a surplus of 350000 and I'm just throwing rough numbers. Where, where does that lie? I mean, our year is over, so where does that money go? Well, um, that money would go to the general fund. I mean, if that's what they're going to have, you know, um, one piece may wind up going, she, Terry and, and uh, Dr. Carver may request a certain amount going into the 1% fund so that they can at least, um, you know, maybe mitigate the expenses she was talking about just now, you know. But they have to ask us first for that, right? That has to go in there first, yeah. And then have, to be used, yes, they, ask, they have to request it from you, from the Board of Finance. We've taken no action on that. Okay, great. And again, what I was talking about, we did this a few years back with the cops. There was a grant. They hire the cops or they hire the teachers. And then, bam, that money is on the, you know, that the school board basically wrote a check for those two teachers, basically wrote a check without us approving it for those two salaries after this uh, grant is over. Isn't that a fair statement? They're not going to fire them. Well, you know, like she said, there are um, certain people that retire at the end of the year. There are certain people that let go, you know, so she's probably going to work the, uh, the staffing depending on the needs and uh, the total level may stay the same or it may go up. And if it goes up, then they included the two new people, you know, so. Uh, and then, then also, you know, I know everybody's following this, this police reform stuff. You know, our state rep, uh, Ali Brandy, whatever is his second district, you know, push for this thing. And I talked to the, 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 the chief and it's going to add two to 300,000 on their budget next year for what that, um, for what that law that they just shoved through everybody's, uh, you know, towns between the training, the data to, to, to all the, all the body cams that we have to back up that, that, that stuff up into a cloud for a year and the training. Uh, Pugner said it's going to be two to 300,000 just for the town of Bethel on new expenses. So just so everybody knows, that just got pushed through by our state reps. And I think it's unfair when they make those laws and then they just walk away and we have to pay the bill. That's not right. I mean, you're probably looking at maybe one person additional to maintain that equipment when the cops come in, because it's unlike the, from what you explained to me, it's unlike the, the car cams, which is automatic right into the service when uh, Bob, if it, back into the, the patrol room and, and Brian can answer the, you know. But it's actually, it is. You have to download it and, and, and um, uh, codify it. It's actually, I just priced out the system for our department, got a bunch of bids. You can do it automated where, you know, when a police officer clears a call, the, the system forces you to, to, to classify it. And, mm -hmm. you know, our bids came in, I think, we're right at around 240, 250,000. But we opted to have our own server mm -hmm. because it's, it's memory's cheap. So the initial outlay for the server is, you know, probably 60,000. But the state is covering 50% of that with a grant, where if you go with that cloud based system, you're going to have a reoccurring expense every year and the state will only uh, take care of. Uh, the first year. So I've spent the past few months, we've actually been looking at this for quite a bit. So, you know, I think a realistic expectation in, you know, year one is, you know, probably 250 to 300. If they get it done before December, there's 50% available. After December, the state's talking about dropping it down to 30% for towns that are in financially good situations. But yeah, it's not a choice. And like mine, I did a five-year contract. So, you know, that'll cover us for five years at 260000 But you, you do have to spend it all up front or the state will not reimburse you. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's an unfunded mandate. They're up there just uh, uh, passing laws and people don't know the real cost that actually comes to us. So again, it's two, 300000 it, it, 
it's going to be no surprise, I hope, to everybody for that one law that they passed. And uh, I, had, I had talked to Chief Pugner. Uh, he will come to the next meeting and kind of do for us at that meeting what the Board of Ed folks did today. Um, I just didn't think we needed one more agenda item tonight. Um, but look, it, it's, it's really easy when there aren't a lot of challenges in the macro and micro environments. It's not easy. We've got lots of challenges. What we have to do, I think, as the Board of Finance is what we have been doing and continue to do that is keep our eye on the two sides of the equation, right? The revenues, see what's happening with the collections. And again, the next important milestone is the October 1st uh, payment. They come in right sometime before the 31st and then expenses. And we know that we're going to have some Board of Ed things to think about, police things to think about. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if some other COVID related items come up. But we just have to be diligent and stay on top of all this stuff. And that's why, that's why we all were um, recommended for a 10% raise in our salary. Next time you pass the attaboy, I mean, next time you pass the petty cash from, get an attaboy out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that, uh, thank you to the motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Oh, Second. wait. Are you, do you have a question, D, or are you? Oh, no, I was going to say me too. <laughs> uh, right. D, D, uh, Dion, did you get uh, the, the motion and the second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Good deal. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the night. Good night. Thanks, everybody.